second uh, proceedings for the second talk. Um, we're really extremely pleased to have Gerard Benarus uh, to give this uh, second talk of the afternoon. Uh, Gerard's one of the pioneers of random matrix theory and, and many other areas, and he specialized in fundamental applications of probability to uncovering properties of random matrices, but also uh, applications to machine learning and, and many other areas. Um, I think he's going to tell us something about um, random determinants and the elastic manifold. Gerard, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So this, uh, I will report on a, on a joint work with Paul Bourgard and Ben McKenna, who are both, I mean, Paul is a professor, Ben is a PhD student uh, who just finished. And, and the title will be Random Determinants and the Elastic Manifold. So the, the goal here will not be in the direction of machine learning, it's, it's statistical physics. The elastic manifold, as you see, is a, a very classical and hard problem in statistical physics, but the link with random, with random matrices is there, and, and this is this random determinant thing. And I will start by that rather fast and then go to the, to the physics problem. So what are we, talk, oops, what are we talking about here? So uh, I will re report on these two joint works, which we just posted a few days ago on archive and uh, with Paul Bourgard and Ben McKenna. And as I said, they, this constitute a part of uh, Ben's PhD, which he defended recently with another work, which I will not cover. And so what do we do? In, in one of them, we compute the topological complexity of the elastic manifold model. Uh, in the context established by Mézard and Parisi in physics in 91. And then we confirm with that the recent work by Jan Fyodorov and Pierre Le Doussal last year about what is called a, a very important transition, which is called the topological trivialization. So I will explain all that. So this is also to, to show that this thing is very active. And in fact, this work by Fyodorov and Le Doussal is what prompted us to to try to put it on a mathematical ground. And we, what we find is exactly what they found. So what we do with that, we compute this topological complexity using the well-known Katz-Rice formula, which of course brings us into the world of random matrix theory. So this, I understand it's a seminar with an emphasis on random matrix. This is where I start. So uh, again, a priori, this problem is a problem in physics, but in fact, we'll take it from a topological or geometrical point of view. And the Katz-Rice formula brings us into random matrix. What the random matrix theory is contributing here is to give some form of asymptotic, exponential asymptotics of, of determinants of random matrices, which are not in the usual invariant classes. And this is done in the other paper uh, in rather broad settings which include the very particular case we need for this uh, elastic manifold problem. And this is a piece of advertisement. Ben will speak about this on Thursday uh, in another, another online seminar, if you allow me for a piece of uh, publicity. Uh, so this one, one word probability seminar on Thursday is made of two parts. You don't have to listen to the first part because I will be giving it on, on the same topic as here, but Ben will have much longer to explain the random determinant part on Thursday. So what is the a little map of the talk? We'll start with this question of random determinants. Then I'll mention a little bit what this question of topological complexity of random function is and the Katz-Rice formula. Well, that is well known, so I'll go pretty fast. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the role of isotropy and isolate one particular problem, which is interesting as we will see later and new. And then I'll go into the disordered elastic media or the elastic manifold model, and then give you the results that we have proven about. All right, so random determinant. For the moment, there is no physics here, just a pure, simple model of problem of random matrix. Take a large random, let's say a real symmetric matrix, HN. And the question is how can you compute the asymptotic of its determinant, let's say first in the exponential scale. So our, our question here is the following. You take this random matrix HN from whatever model you want, take its determinant, take the absolute value of it, because that's what we need in, in, in the complexity question, take the expectation, and then take one over and log of that, try to find the limit if it exists. Okay, so this is, uh, before going to this question, in fact, random determinants have a long history. Here's a 
a few references. I was surprised to see that people had looked at it even before a random matrix was really uh, working. So for instance, Forte did it in 51, and then you have uh, nice names like Turkey and Rice, the same Rice Reward and Nikwis Prekopa, and Amir Dembo, our good friend who told us that in fact it was probably what uh, decided him to go from engineering to math, this paper in 89. So uh, you have, uh, and then you have many other results, more recent, see on Gaussian fluctuation of determinants, for instance, by Tao uh, Vu and Guyen Vu, uh, the recent work by Bourgade, Modi and Pain, and, uh, you know, about determinant, we just heard, what is the probability that the determinant is zero, right, with the constant intercommonal, but here I'm not interested in the probability of this being zero, I'm interested in the, the, the situation where the determinant is exponentially large. So let's look naively. So I, I'm explaining now what, why our question looks like it should be easy. So expectation of absolute value of a determinant is just expectation of exponential n times a simple function of the spectral measure, mu h n, which is just the integral of the absolute value of the, uh, I'm sorry, the integral of the log of the absolute value, right? Because you write the determinant as the product of the eigenvalues, absolute value of the term is product of the absolute value of the eigenvalues. This is exponential times sum of the log of those guys. So it's exponential n times one over n sum of the logs. This is just the formula I wrote here. So now if you assume that the empirical spectral measure converges to some deterministic limit, which usually happens in good models, and that it concentrates fast enough, it's tempting to believe that this behaves. So when you take one over n log of this thing, it should behave like psi of mu infinity, right? All right, so that's what is tempting to believe. And uh, so this looks really like a question on concentration, but do you have fast enough concentration to do that? Of course, for instance, take the simplest example, take HN from the GOE, then it's a trivial question because you have an LDP in scale n square. So, here in this, in this interval here, the probability that the mu at hn is far from mu infinity, which is the same circle here, is exponential minus n square small. So then of course the concentration is trivial. So, but otherwise, what can you do? So of course there's a strong literature on concentration for the spectral measure, for instance, to the semicircle in the Wigner case. So I just I isolated a few uh, papers that I found important in this direction here, but there are many, many more. And um, of course, there's another question that the logarithm is not completely a good function. There is a singularity at zero, right? Precisely the problem we just heard about, the probability that the matrix be singular. And there is a prob problem at infinity. So can you tame easily those things? So I keep the, uh, uh, here's a very, I'll be fast on that, but here's a very abstract nonsense result. Imagine that your matrix is a nice function phi of IID random variable. And M here, the number of such a thing may depend on N, but doesn't have to be N. Then under this collection of, uh, of assumptions, you have the result I just predicted would be easy, right? So the assumption is that the XIs are independent. Phi is a good function, is a Lipschitz and pool convex sets back to convex sets. New infinity is a nice measure, which and the concentration is uh, in this polynomial scale. And you have some very coarse bound, I don't want to be too precise, on very large and very small eigenvalues to get rid of the singularity of the log, plus some stability of the spectrum under truncation. Under this abstract nonsense thing, you have the conclusion. Of course, to prove this theorem, it's simply you go back to basics and use Talagrand's result on concentration of product measures, you truncate the variable, then your phi is Lipschitz. You can see that the log potential we're looking at is in fact almost a Lipschitz convex function of some bounded uh, independent random variables, and then things are easy. The benefit of writing in this generality then with much more work, it allows you to cover a wide variety of random matrix models, which are not linked to what we do today. So Wigner, sample covariance, Erdős Reni, band matrices, et cetera. Here is a theorem that is in this paper on random determinants, which now is more concrete than the abstract nonsense theorem I was giving before. So you have the result we expect when your matrix HN is a Wigner matrix, so not GOE, Wigner, 
And you just need two plus epsilon finite moments, which is near optimal. You can take a sample covariance matrix or the, your preferred theorem in, in, in random matrices with again, two plus epsilon finite moments. You can take an Erdos-Rheny graph incidence matrix with a parameter P, which is slightly above the critical one over N. Or in a completely different world, you can take a free addition model. AN plus ON, BN, ON transpose when ON is a random orthogonal matrix distributed under the Haar measure and AN and BN are two sequences of matrices. Of course, in this case, the measure mu infinity is the one you can guess. In the Wigner case, of course, it's the uh, semicircle. Here it will be the Pastor Marchenko. Here it will be the semicircle again. And here, of course, it will be the free convolution. So, you know, it's just a sample of what you can do, which shows that our, that, you know, the, the assumption that we had that the, the answer would be that is kind of confirmed in many, many cases. But that's not the case. Um, so let's, for instance, let's just look at the Wigner case. So uh, in the, the Wigner case, the XIs are just the upper triangular matrix entries. And phi is just the, the map that copies these upper triangular below the diagonal. And with minimal amount assumption, moment assumption, the condition E here, oops, here, uh, this kind of concentration is already given by Alexander Tikhomirov. The condition C is the consequence of Nguyen and condition S follows from argument of Baldenav, Caputo and Shafai using Bennett's inequality. So, you know, you have everything, you put it in this big machine and it gives you the result. And note that our moment is up, up, almost optimal because in fact, if the distribution of the entries had an infinite second moment, then the determinant, the expectation of the determinant is infinite. There is no point in the problem, doesn't make sense. So uh, essentially we do as good as can be. Of course, this, this theorem is based on Talagrand's result. And we have another second theorem, which is very different with in fact, an easier proof, uh, which use more, you know, uh, gromov milman concentration or log Sobolev inequality. And this allows us to understand many other cases, for instance, Gaussian matrices, but with a variance profile even with some correlation, or Gaussian block matrices, which are a completely different word. And in fact, this is what we need for this work on, uh, on physics. So for instance, here's the theorem, the example we will need. So again, we have the same thing here, but notice that here, I'm not saying that this object concentrate, converge to something. I'm saying that it is close to something, which still depends on N. And for instance, here, HN would be a Gaussian matrix with a good block structure. Think this, take a large matrix where you have two blocks on the diagonal, which are two large GOEs and zero outside of the diagonal, this one, and then add to that a deterministic sequence of matrices. Right? Then this works. And, but now I have to tell you what this mu N is. So this mu n comes from the matrix Dyson equation as developed by Laszlo Erdős and his collaborators. And so it's computed essentially on information about HN. So a priori in general, there is no limit, but in our application, of course, this uh, Dyson equation will converge to something we can control, right? So I won't spend more time on that. And I really encourage you to go and listen to, to Ben, uh, who will explain that in more details in two days, uh, but this is the result we need. And um, I guess you get a feeling that it's, it, it's not as easy as it looks. That is, we, there is a little bit of work to be put there, but, 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 the, but the result is, is entirely natural in some sense. All right. So now that we have this tool prepped for us from random metrics, let's go to random geometry. So complexity of random functions, so you, I've already given many times this kind of talk and it's well known. So take a smooth function, a compact manifold of large dimension. Assume that the function is a Morse function. So you can, the critical points are non-degenerate. And then because the manifold is compact, you can compute the number of critical points. It's finite. So then you want to count this number. Okay, that's the problem here. And you may also want to count the number of critical points say with a given index 
for instance, the number of local minima. You may also want to fix the range of critical values. All these are important problems, in particular when you want to apply this thing to statistical physics, because in statistical physics, this random smooth function will be an inner energy or Hamiltonian. And you want to count the number of local minima of this Hamiltonian, and typically with low values, because that's where the Gibbs measure wants to concentrate that low temperature. If you are more on the mathematical side, you may be interested in the topology of the sublevel sets. For instance, their Betty numbers. All right, so let's, this is the kind of problem, the question of uh, complexity, if you want here, topological complexity of a smooth random function. Okay, so let me call crit K, the, the number of critical points of the function of index K and crit K F B, the number of critical points of index K such that the value, the critical value f of x is in b, b being a subset of the real line. So this counts the number of critical points with fixed index and fixed range of values. Here is the cat's rice formula, not that difficult. The expectation, <coughs> I'm sorry, of this number is given by an integral on m of two things. One thing is very simple, this phi x here, is just the density of the law of the gradient of f. Gradient of f is, of course, Gaussian vector if f is Gaussian. And uh, so you look at the density and you take the value of the density at zero, which is reasonable because you're looking at critical points. So you want the gradient to be zero. So that's a very easy thing. The, the other one contains all the important information. Ek of x is this. It's the expectation of the absolute value of the Hessian of x conditioned by the fact that X is critical. And if you want to fix the range of values, you fix it here, indicator of X of X in B. If you want to fix the index, you fix it here. Of course, I recall that the index of a critical point is the number of uh, negative eigenvalue for the Hessian. All right, so this cat's rice formula uh, establishes in fact a link as we see here, between the, this complexity of smooth Gaussian functions and random matrix theory, when the dimension of the manifold tends to infinity. Because of course here, we have a random matrix. Where's the random matrix? It's the Hessian of F conditioned by grad of F being zero. That's a random matrix if F is a random function. And notice that we have here an expectation of the absolute value of the determinant of a random matrix. So that's exactly the kind of question we were talking about a minute ago. And look also that here you have the integral of this expectation of the absolute value of a determinant, which we hope behaves like exponential n times something. And th then we have here this uh, density, which with the normalization we will choose will also behave like exponential n times something. So here we have exponential n times something. So Laplace's method should give us the asymptotic behavior of this thing. Of course, except that the dimension of m also diverges with n, which is a little problem here, but globally you can expect that you can do, you can understand the asymptotics of this expectation. If you do understand the asymptotics of the absolute value of the determinant of a Hessian of a random matrix. So if there is a question, this is a good moment to, to ask because this is really the, the, the core of what we're gonna do here for this problem of uh, physics. All right. So F defined the, 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 the field of real symmetric matrices, the Hessian. And as I said, the important thing is to understand the determinant of this conditioned by the fact that the point is critical. So of course, uh, there's one class where this task is well understood. It's when the Gaussian distribution of this function is isotropic. And more recently in the work of Aufinger, Tuka, Aufinger and uh, Zhang, uh, the more general class of isotropic increments, which is much more complicated. All right, so let's talk about isotropy for a moment. So if you have a Riemannian manifold, then you look at a centered Gaussian process indexed by X, such that the covariance, let's say the covariance of between F of X and F of Y is just a function g of the distance, that's isotropy. And then of course, this function cannot be 
whatever you want, because this has to be a covariance. So you have to know what G is allowed. When you have this, of course, you can see that the variance is constant, the G of zero. So then you can assume that this G of zero is one, let's say to simplify. And then in fact, this, uh, this Gaussian process induces a metric, which is given by the left-hand side here. And it is equivalent topologically to the Riemannian metric in this case. All right, here's one simple case, the simplest of all. It's the case where the manifold is in the sphere. I won't spend much time on that because I've spent too much time in my life on these functions. So if the manifold is the unit sphere, then the function such that G of the distance on the sphere is positive definite have been characterized by Schoenberg a long time ago. And here they are. This G has this form. And where this AP here has to be non-negative, that's the important thing. And D is the distance. Another way to write this is to say that this uh, covariance function is just a function nu of the, over, of the inner product between x and y. You should just write what the cosine is. And, this is, and nu is this function. And if you look at it, you recognize here a class of very well-known thing. That's the class of models in physics, which are called mixed spherical spin glasses. And here it is, the Hamiltonian, whose covariance is the one I just described, is this. Sum of square root of AP, which you can take because we said that AP was non-negative, times HP of X. And HP of X is what is called a pure P-spin. And it's simply the random homogeneous polynomial of degree P. So that's another way to enter this problem. You, you just say, I take a polynomial of degree P of N variables, and I take it to be homogeneous. I restrict it to the sphere, and that's it. And how do I take it to be random? I assume the coefficient here, the Js, to be IID N01. Believe me, if you take a two-line computation, you see that the covariance of this is exactly that. So this class of model, which are all possible isotropic model on the sphere, have been discovered much later, 40 or 50 years later, by physicists as the important models of spherical spin glasses. And they have been studied abundantly. So there's now a large literature on the complexity of these models. And not only their complexity, the topological complexity I described, the number of critical points and all that, but also the behavior of the Gibbs measure at low temperature, which in some sense, this new approach on the Gibbs measure gives sharper results to than the usual Parisi approach based on the overlap. So of course, the, the, these, I mean, this literature on complexity goes to Fyodorov, to Tuka, Alfinger, and Yezhichirny and myself. More recently, a fantastic series of work by Eliran Subag, and then Subag and Zaituni, and uh, Tuka again and Gold, and more, more recently at even higher temperature by uh, Okozhaganat and myself. But I won't go there. So while that was possible, it's because here, the random matrix that you find in this dictionary, because the model is isotropic, the random matrix is, of course, a very simple modification of the GOE, just a little shift of the GOE. So then the whole arsenal of random matrix theory is accessible. You have large division, you have very detailed information about the GOE, which allows you to, do all, to use very massively this. Some of these works go much further than what I'm, I just described. For instance, Subag does uh, describe the not only the annealed complexity, which I just explained, but also the quench complexity, which is much harder. And this is this information that is useful for understanding the Gibbs measure. All right, that's the past. Now let's take an, still an isotropic case, which is a Gaussian function on Rn and not on a manifold. So same thing, you take an isotropic centered Gaussian field on Rn, then its covariance will be a function of the distance. And we normalize it like this because it's traditional. This classification has also been done by Schoenberg and also by Jaglom a little later. And it's an, the, 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 this class of models is entirely well known. This function B cannot be whatever. It has to have this shape where C0 is a non-negative number and nu is a positive measure, finite. So the whole class of such isotropic field, Gaussian field is known. 
Jaglom was very interested in them because of turbulence. Schoenberg was interested in them just for harmonic analysis uh, inquiries. And so we take this general class. So if you want, this is like a, a spherical spin glass, but now this is something on our end, this random noise. We will assume that this function B at zero, it's derivative and second derivative are non-zero to avoid simple degeneracies. And then now we want to do complexity for this. But this function, there is no reason you can count the number of critical points. It's not on a compact manifold. So to put it on a compact regime, if you want, you have to put it in a bounding potential. So for instance, you put it in a harmonic well. So now here's your Hamiltonian. You take mu over two of u square norm plus this random noise. So this is a harmonic well, and this is noise. And now this is very similar to the spherical case we we're talking about. And you can ask yourself the same question about complexity. So if you want, this is a soft spin glass in an isotropic well, because this well is isotropic and the structure of the noise is isotropic here too. So you can ask the same question about the topological complexity of this model. This has also been studied a lot by Fyodorov in the 2000s. And uh, you could see Mesar and Parisi for physics motivation for that, or Aufinger and, and Zhang in 2020 for a generalization to this isotropic increment. And you have a, a full picture again. Here, the random matrix is simple. It's just a modification of the GOE. All right, so why do we care about non-GOE in this case? Here is a simple case, which for the moment seems completely academic. I just take the same thing, the same noise, but I put it in an anisotropic well, right? So instead of taking the norm square, I think I put here a real symmetric positive matrix, dn, all right? So when dn is the identity, it's the same model as the one we had before. So now it's a soft spin glass in an anisotropic well. If you want, I could have looked maybe at this on, uh, instead of on the sphere, I could have looked at this on ellipsoids or something like that, but anyway. So we will see that this very simple thing is in fact of real importance to understand the much harder model of elastic manifold. So again, you can ask the same question about the topological complexity of this model, but now the random matrix that comes here, the Hessian of this will of course be the Hessian of the noise, which is isotropic plus, and so related to the GOE plus DN, which is obviously the Hessian of this quadratic form. So now we have DN plus a GOE type thing. So of course we are entering the realm of free convolution, right? Which as we will see is the case. So in this case, so let's assume for simplification that the eigenvalues of DN are bounded away from zero and infinity, that the spectral measure of DN converges to something, mu D, then we can compute the total annual complexity. If you call N the total number of critical points, then here it is. You have a formula for it. This total complexity is a function of this limiting spectral measure and of the variance B second of zero, which is a characteristic of the noise. And here is the, the function. It's this thing, the log lambda mu d of d lambda. And then you have a variational problem here, soup. And here the free convolution between the spectral measure of d and the semicircle here, sigma b. And in fact, you can compute this thing. This complexity vanishes for low enough noise. So when B second of zero is smaller than a critical value and is positive about, above this threshold. So let's stop a minute to see what this means. This is an example of topological trivialization. When there is, because of course, if you go back to the, the model itself here, there's a smooth well, which is not complex at all and you add noise, which is very complex. So of course, when the noise is weak, you can expect that the, the complexity does not, of the noise does not win. When the noise is strong, it might win. And this is what we see in this result here. That is when the noise is low, then the complexity vanishes. The function is not complex. And when the noise is large, the function is complex in the sense that its mean number of critical points is exponentially large. All right. And 
In fact, above the threshold, this soup can be computed explicitly. It's a bit painful, so I spare you that. And you can understand very precisely the topological transition. This complexity, when you let the noise go down to from above to the critical value, vanishes quadratically. You can compute this coefficient. It's b minus bc squared. You can do the same for the complexity of minima. Instead of if you want to count the number of minima, and not only the number of critical points, you can do that too. You have a similar type of formula. And what you find, it's also topological complexity, uh, topological trivialization, which is at the same value for the noise. But now instead of being quadratic, it's cubic. So we have, uh, we have a, quite a detailed thing in, in, that we do in this paper. Understanding this variational principle is rather delicate. And we use Berger's equation for the semicircle and an important recent inequality for the number of minima, which is recent, in fact, which is due to Guillonet, Alice Guillonet and Milan Maida in 2020. Okay, so that was one spin glass in an anisotropic well, which is kind of an academic example of something where you need, in this case, you do need, again, the your, your Hessian is not the GOE and you need the result I mentioned before on random determinants. All right, so now let's come to have 20 more minutes to come to the real problem here, which is called the, the problem of disordered elastic media or like the physicists like to call it the elastic manifold. All right, here is a quotation by Gamarki, which says many seemingly different system which tells you that this problem in physics is important and describes it this way. In all this system, an internal elastic structure uh, is subjected to the, to the effect of disorder. And, and then he mentions something which is a consequence of the transition we're talking about, supposedly, that is a special inter especially interesting feature of all this system is that these disordered elastic structures can be set in motion by applying an external force on them and that the motion will be drastically affected by the presence of disorder. This is what is called the pinning, depinning transition in physics. And in some sense, there's um, when the system is complex, it's supposed to be hard to move. And when it's not complex, it's supposed to be easy to move. That's this pinning, depinning transition. What properties result from the competition between elasticity and disorder is extremely complicated. All right. so. Let's go to the model. So first I will describe it in the continuum because it might be more natural. So take an open subset of RD and look at the following energy functional on, this, on the space of smooth function with values in Rn. So the Hamiltonian we're looking at here is the elastic energy, the H1 norm, if you want, the integral on omega of grad U square plus a potential integral of V of X and U of X. And this V is a smooth potential. So that's the Hamiltonian. The first thing you want to do very classically is find a minimization problem. Find the U's, the function U's, minimizing U, minimizing H, I'm sorry. Of course, for that, you have to add a, a boundary condition. We will work under periodic boundary condition on cubes, but you could do Dirichlet or whatever you want. So let's, Keep in mind what this model includes here. You have two integers, d, the, the dimension of the open set, which is in physics called the internal dimension, and n, which is the dimension of the field. The u takes is a function from rd to rn. You also have the open set omega, and you have the potential v. And that gives you the model. That's the model we're interested in. That's the elastic manifold, if you want. All right except I have to say what V is. So V, as we have just seen in, in, you know, with one particle, we start with a confining potential, like the harmonic potential, as we just did, and then we add disorder. The N is a random potential here. So for simplicity, we assume that at X, when X is fixed, at a given position, the N is a Gaussian smooth function centered with isotropic covariance, like we have seen before. And also we assume that's not simply the, that this noise is really uh, uh, fast decorrelating in X. So at each position, it looks like what we've just described and then it decorrelating fast in X. 
So then this is the way we write our Hamiltonian. We have the elastic energy, we have the harmonic potential, the bounding potential to confine it, and then we have the random noise. All right, so we have three terms. These three terms play different roles. The first one wants to, the function to be flat. The first term here, if you want to minimize it, you want to have gradient zero, which means you want your function to be flat. The second term, you want the function to be small, if you want to minimize this. So you want the function to be close to zero. And this one adds trouble. This one is noise. So the first one wants the function to be flat. The second one wants the function to be close to zero. And the noise wants to play the role of noise that is add disorder and complexity. And it's the competition between these effects that you want to capture as the citation, the quotation I was giving, was giving us. If you are really working in the continuum, what you would want to do is to construct the Gibbs measure given by this Hamiltonian. You take an inverse temperature beta and you construct the Gibbs measure. And of course this du is the uniform measure on functions, of course does not exist. So it does not, this does not really make sense. You can make sense of it by taking a limit, of course, from a discrete model. And this is what we'll do now. You discretize this problem to try to make sense of it. So let's look at the discretized problem. So here you have, remember you had three terms, integral of grad square, which of course you can write as by integrating by part, this is Laplace in U, U. Then you have the L2 norm, and then you have the noise. So let's do that. The discretization you get, the elastic term is this, u of x minus u of y. So now I take my open set to be a cube and I discretize it. So I take a discrete box, one l to the d, and my sites x and y are now discrete points on a box of size l in dimension d. And when x is a neighbor to y, you look at the increment u of x minus u of y, square it, this plays the role of the integral of gradu square. Then you have the L2 norm, which is just that, and then you have the noise. Again, my noise here, Vn, is isotropic with the covariance that we know. And here I ask, I put this Dirac mass, which means that at two different locations, the noise is independent. I have IID copies at different locations. So at every one of those locations, if you didn't have the elastic term, this would just be a sum of what we've seen before. So the disorder, as I said, is assumed to be IID in X and isotropic in the field. And as we say, the, the B had to be like that. So if you had L equal one, if your box is just one point or D equals zero, that's what physicists say, then you just have one point, one site and no interaction. So the model is back to what I just described before, the soft spin glass in a harmonic potential. And so our general model here, this is how to think of it, this elastic manifold, is the system in this box LD, at each site, you have one of those soft spin glasses in a harmonic potential, and they interact through the elastic interaction, which tend to want to have them aligned, right? To smooth this thing up. All right. So there are many special cases where the model is interesting. For instance, if you take the internal dimension to be one and the, and the field dimension n to be fixed, here is the Hamiltonian as we described before, the kinetic energy, the uh, elastic energy, the L2 norm, the noise. And if you look at it, then you realize that this is of course, if you now let L go to infinity, the size of the box, then this is of course, the celebrated directed polymer in a random potential. And you know, the Gibbs measure I was describing before, this thing will give you the Brownian motion, and then you would have a uh, here Einstein Lindbergh type potential, and then noise. So this is an interesting model a limit, in fact. There are many, many other models that are interesting. For instance, when you take n equals d plus one and L goes to infinity, there are many models of random interfaces in there. That's not the, the limit we're taking here. We are taking at the other limit when D and N are fixed and N goes to infinity. So that's what uh, was done by uh, Fisher, Dan Fisher a long time ago now, and then Mesar Parisi in, uh, in the beginning of the nineties. And then this has been work. I mean, the work has been constant on that for years. This paper by Le Dussal, Muller and Wiese is really hard to read for us mathematician. It's a, uh, 
renormalization group type things, which honestly I don't get. And then this recent work by Fyodorov and Dussal is much closer to what we can understand. And this result started what we do here. So here's the Hamiltonian. And now I add two parameters, A and B, because I want to have two free parameters to give different roles to these different uh, uh, terms. And of course I can rewrite it by just the integration by part, as I said here, this, is the, this gives you the identity term here, the L2 norm. This term here gives you the Laplacian. This is the discrete Laplacian. And, and then I rename my, my mu zero and T zero are easy functions of A and B. So here's the Hamiltonian as we wanted to study it. And I slowly brought it, took time to say why this is a very natural model. All right, so D is the Lap lattice Lap Laplacian, the periodic lattice Laplacian. Mu zero and T zero are free parameters. Mu zero is related to mass, to the mass constant, in fact, mu zero square. And T zero is the elast measures the, elast the elasticity. And again, Vn is a, a centered smooth Gaussian field. We assume that B is nice, four times differentiable. So that Vn is smooth, is C2, so we can apply cats rice and we avoid degeneracies. So here's the model again. That's what we are studying. This thing, and we have a phase diagram here with mu zero and T zero that we can play with. N is fixed, D is fixed, N is going to infinity. All right, so summary of our results on this model. So what we do is we what we do is the following. First, we compute the annealed topological complexity of this Hamiltonian. That is, we compute the log logarithm of the average of the number of critical points and of local minima. That's what anneal mean. I should have put average here. Quench would mean to compute something much harder, which is the expectation of the logarithm of number of critical points. All right. This complexity is, so of course, in order to do that, we use catch price. This complexity is given by a very complicated variational problem, which we happen to be able to solve through a miracle, I will come to that. And then using solving this thing, we show that there is a sharp transition between a region of positive complexity and a region of vanishing complexity. That is again, a form of topological trivialization. When the mass is large enough, then the, or if you want, when the, the, the noise is small enough, then the landscape is trivial. And when otherwise the landscape is exponentially complex. There is exponentially many local minima and exponentially many critical points. And we understand this transition, which is called the Larkin mass for reasons pertaining to physics. And, and these results, as I said, confirm few, I mean, the recent work by Fyodorov and Ledoussal. So what we do not do, that's sometimes more important in a talk than what we do. So what we haven't done is that we do not compute the quench topological complexity again. So we compute the, the one over n log of the mean number and not really one over n log of the number. So the, in the cases that, uh, that have been done mathematically like the spherical spin glasses, going from an yield quench was a big effort. And there are still a lot of questions that are completely open there. So here it's seriously open. The complexity question we look at is a zero temperature question. We look at finding, let's say, how hard it is to find the minimum of its energy. If the landscape is complicated, it should be hard. But we do not study yet the Gibbs measure at positive temperature, as has been done for spin glasses. And this is totally open. And of course, now I come to this, this quote from physics. Even if we believe our physicist friends, like Le Doussal and Shadorov, or Gyabarki, we are not yet at the point where we can understand how this transition in the complexity of the landscape induces a transition, this important transition between pinning and de-pinning. That is what happens if now we add a force in this landscape and, and show that there is pinning when there is complexity and de-pinning where there is no complexity. And even less, we don't understand how this de-pinning would happen dynamically, what kind of time scales would create the deepening, would make this thing move when the force is high enough. 
All right, so these are, as you understand, things that are open that we probably hope to do, but I mean, you're welcome to try if you have uh, an interest in that. So stating our results a little more carefully now, and I will conclude with that. So let me call n tot, like totality, total, the random number of all critical points of the elastic manifold that I, the Hamiltonian that I described before. Then we prove that the, uh, the complexity is computable. So one over, so what is the dimension of this problem? You have n times ld, you have ld points on the box, in the box and at each point you have dimension n. So the total dimension is n times ld. L is fixed here and you let n go to infinity, this limit exists. The logarithm of the mean number of total of critical point, it's computable. It's a function of the mass, the elastic constant and the strength of the noise. Similarly, if you look at the random number of all local minima, you have the same result with a different functional, which is called sigma minimum, function of the same quantities. And these two functions, sigma and sigma minimum, are explicit. So here's an explicit formula for them. So let me explain how it works. For Look at this matrix, identity, mu zero identity minus T zero Laplacian, discrete Laplacian in the box. So this is of course a real symmetric matrix of size LD and, uh, and it's per perfectly deterministic. There is no noise here, it's just the Laplacian. And you look at the spectral measure, everybody can compute, let's say under periodic boundary condition, what the eigenvalues of the discrete Laplacian are. And you call mu this discrete measure. And then you, I call a sigma b the semicircle as before, of radius two square root of b. So these are the important notation I need. And here's the variational formula. The total complexity at mass mu zero, elastic constant t zero and noise level b is given by this one over LD log of the determinant of this deterministic thing, plus a soup of this thing here, where here you have sigma B plus I mean, free convolution with this measure mu. So if you remember, this is exactly the formula we had for the, an, for the spin glass in an anisotropic well, right? Where, which was the case where D equals zero. Uh, and then the sigma mean is the same thing, except that instead of taking the soup for all u's, I take the soup of all u's less than L, and L is the left end of the support of the free convolution here. Right, so we have two explicit formula. I mean, not completely explicit there because I still have this soup in u. I tell you that in fact, you can compute, we do compute the supremum in u. And again, it's rather painful. I don't want to show you what it is. But more importantly, we have the transition. So if I give you, if I fix, let's say two of these three parameters, let's say the noise B, the noise level and T zero, the elastic constant, then I define the Larkin mass as the unique solution mu critical of this equation. Remember, this is the Laplacian. This is a perfect, the empirical spectral measure of the Laplacian, perfectly deterministic. So you, this is a simple equation. This fixes a, a unique mu c, which we call the Larkin mass. And then the really important conclusion about topological trivialization is that when the mass is larger than mu c, then the total and the minima complexity vanish. And so in words, this means that when you have a large enough mass, then that is if you want, if you're, if your quadratic potential is sufficiently strong, the bounding thing is sufficiently strong, it kills all the exponential complexity of the landscape. And of course you could, and, and on the contrary, I didn't write it here, but when mu is smaller than that, the complexity is positive. Of course, you could, you may want to phrase it differently. I could introduce the noise level B, which is for B second of zero. And when this noise level is smaller than a critical noise level, then the complexity vanish. When the noise is strong enough, the complexity is positive. So we have understood the complexity and we have the, the sharp transition. In fact, we do have the, so I'm, I'm saying here below the Larkin mass, the annealed complexity are positive and explicit. And um, all right, so all that maybe I can skip. 
so the, the phase transition can be explained properly. So here I explain it in terms of the noise level. And, and exactly as what we had before, the, the full complexity, the total complexity vanishes quadratically. And the complexity of the minima vanishes cubically. So this is exactly the same type of phase transition as the one I presented in a simple case before. And this is, of course, what was predicted by, uh, by uh, Fyodorov and Ledusov. All right, and now I can conclude. Here's a proof in a nutshell in one slide, because I think now we have all the elements. So you have this random function in dimension L to the LD, to the L to the D. Gaussian, you can apply cat's rice. So the function is Gaussian and smooth, you can apply cat's rice. So the first thing to do is you have to understand what the Hessian is at a point conditioned by the fact that the point is critical. That's easy because conditioning is not hard. And then what you find is that this Hessian has a very specific structure. It, was, it is of course a Gaussian random matrix, but it has the shape I gave you before. It is a block matrix with GOEs on the diagonal to which you add a big large matrix, which is deterministic. What is this large matrix? It's essentially the discrete Laplacian. So you have this structure, this block structure. This thing is not at all invariant and you need the first result, I, I mean, the, the, the approach I gave you initially to be able to compute the determinant. So you apply the result of our companion paper of the random determinant, that's the block structure Gaussian matrix. Then as I mentioned, you apply catch rice you apply your Laplace formula and you get a variational formula naturally, because Laplace formula gives you a variational formula, but which is not in dimension one, like the one I just show you, it's in dimension L to the D. So very, very heavy variational formula. And at this point, essentially you think that you're dead. But in fact, the variational problem can be reduced to the one mentioned above, which is much simpler because it's one dimensional. And it honestly, it's reduced through a miracle. There is an unexpected convexity which reduces it, it's a, it's a piece of luck, at least for seen from my window, for seen from the window of uh, Paul and Ben, it's probably more reasonable to say that it's a piece of hard work. Um, and um, I, I don't think that any of us expected this convexity, it probably hides something. Uh, and then once you have reduced it to this one dimensional problem, it's reduced to one variational problem, which is exactly the one of the spin glass in an anisotropic random potential. And since we understand this uh, uh, random potential problem, this dimension zero problem, I reduce our hard problem to this one, then we, we get what we get here about the topological transition for the elastic manifold. And uh, with that, I will close. Fantastic, Gerard. That was uh, extraordinary. Uh, very comprehensive and beautiful. Uh, lovely results. Thank you very much indeed. So, um, uh, questions or comments uh, for Gerard? I think uh, either the rules are, as you, you will understand, either unmute yourself and ask, put your little hand up, or, um, or type them into the chat, um, uh, whichever is most convenient for you. So perhaps while people are thinking and typing, um, I can kick off. So this, this um, is there any sort of further sort of scaling limit close to mu c where you might see some additional structure, do, do you believe? Or yeah, yeah, double, a this... double scaling limit that, that might exist there? Yes, yeah, so this probably, Yes, so it's useful then to start in the simple problem, the, uh, the spin glass in an anisotropic potential, right? Before, mm -hmm. because you see here, the, what we prove here that, so you have these isotropic potential and noise, and then we couple them through this elastic term. And then by some miracle, we see that the variational problem re reduces to solving an anisotropic mm -hmm. problem.
problem at every site. So the first thing would be to study your question in the anisotropic case. I don't know, but I, I know other cases where what the question you're asking is solvable. So if you have just a minute, if you do that for the spherical spin glass, we didn't, there we didn't have the same parameters. For the spherical spin glass, which is so correspond to dimension zero, one model only, we didn't have this model of the radi of the mass. The mass would correspond there to the radius of the sphere, right? So that's the strength of your bounding potential. And it's true that we could have played with this one to see how at some point the complexity disappears or, or not. What we played there, we see what we, we had this threshold over there, which happened when we moved the value, which is something more detailed that we didn't do here. What happened at the criticality could be understood there very, very clearly. And this, this was dedicated. This is exactly what Subag and Zaytuni did. You, in this case, you could really see when you had this appearance of the, you know, this, this threshold was in fact corresponding to the ground state. And the question you're asking is what's going on very near the ground state? And this was sold by, uh, by, uh, by uh, Offer and uh, Eliran. I'm sure that this kind of thing can be done here, but we're not there yet. Okay. And I would start, if somebody wants to start, I would start with the, 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 the anisotropic well and it was D equals zero, just to see what's going on. Great, thanks. Uh, Emma. Thank you, uh, and uh, thank you, Joao, for the talk. Um, a, a couple, I think, of, of quick questions. Firstly, um, how how easy is it? So your, your result is, is powerful in its generality. How easy is it to check your conditions for particular models? You, you, what do you mean? Which conditions? So you had a series of these these lettered conditions, right? Oh, you mean for the first part, for the random determinant thing? Yes. Yes. So this is why, OK. So the way I presented that was here's four or five abstract things, which seems very natural if you think in terms of solving the problem, right? You want to get rid of the small eigenvalues, large eigenvalues, you want to be able to truncate, blah, blah, blah. And then, then if you do this abstract nonsense thing, it doesn't look too hard to apply uh, some form of Talagon concentration. Uh, so that's right. And the proof is rather natural there. But then the, in order to prove that this was, uh, useful. This is why I gave you this list of, uh, of models so uh, in which the conditions are satisfied. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned the Wigner case where the condition, you saw that to answer really your question, to, to, to solve, to, to prove the, the assumptions, uh, whatever I call them, E, C, S, I needed quite strong results. Yes. I needed some other people work and just to feed it in. And so, and in fact, for the other models, it's like the Erdos-Reni work or the uh, sample covariance where it also works. It's quite a bit of work to check these things. And this is what the first paper does, in fact. And then we have this other proof, which is a little different, which introduces this matrix Dyson equation, which honestly was away from, far from what I would have thought of, but what was brought by, uh, Paul Bogat, who knows that well, of course, and this is a fantastic tool. In fact, we were helped also by Erdős and uh, Röge. Uh, there was a delicate point here where they really were very helpful. So have a look at this first paper and you will see how this works. We gave two examples of things around concentration. Uh, maybe there are other ways to do that. It's a very natural question. And we illustrated it by a bunch of examples. We stopped at some point, but but, uh, but when in particular when we covered the example we needed for this. Great, thank you. I see there's other questions, so I won't hog uh, the, the time for now. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Uh, Nick. Uh, yeah, I, I wondered if you could comment on uh, non-zero index critical points. I whether they're yeah. interesting and whether you think the calculations are <laughs> okay. So in this case, um, so here is, let me go again to the D equals zero to one site, no interaction, right? So let's say, and if you want, we could go to the, um, to the, to the spherical spin glass case, which is uh, the case which has been worked uh, more seriously. So there, if you remember the results at low time, so you have uh, points of finite index uh, only low in the landscape, right? And there the minima dominate exponentially. 
right? So you have exponentially more when you have saddle points of index one, you have local minima and they are in much larger numbers. So at this, for the same height, right? For the same altitude. So typically uh, it's complicated to, con to, to, to control things which are subdominant, right? And, uh, but this has been done, in fact, in a spherical case by Tuka and Gold, uh, Tuka, I'm, I'm sorry, Alfinger and Gold, right? And there they have sharp estimates of the, uh, the number of critical points of fixed index K, right? And so here it might also be done, but it's much harder. The trick over there, if you look at the initial paper with the Tuka and Cherny, is that we had an exact formula for things of index K using a trick, which was related to the fact that we had GOE, right? That we had this very special matrix. Here, this trick would probably not work. So you need more imagination. And I, and I don't know. Here's another question, a return a question to you. What we've studied is, of course, the case of finite index. But in fact, you also have points of, of diverging index. They are not in the same place, but they are there. And, um, and so it's also interesting to study that. But so in, in this, because when you look at the descent, when you go down from a random point, that's the point you, you hit first. You don't first find local minima, which are hard to find. You first come close or not, to points of diverging index. And uh, so having their number is also an important thing. Medic. So I guess ultimately we really want to know how the quench complexity looks like, even though it's not clear how to do it, but there's a cat rice formula for higher moments as well. And is it possible to like use this this way to approach it and see whether higher moments show that a new complexity really tells you. All right, so this is of course a very natural question. And the, this is how we started for, this is the question that we asked Eliran Subak when he was a beginning PhD student. He did it for spin glasses, for pure spin glasses. And indeed he did it like you mentioned it. That is now if you want, you can compute the second moment using the catch rice formula. And use, looking at a second moment is looking at a, a pair of random matrices at, and now which are correlated, right? And so that's the point, that, that's the difficulty. Now, the, what Eliran proved is that when you had in a pure P-spin, when you were at low enough energy, close to the ground state, the second moment correspond to the square of the first moment roughly. And then from that, you could prove constant, I mean, it was much more work, proof concentration. That is that the annealed complexity was equal to the quench complexity, right? At very low level. Now, above that, we know nothing. In particular, I would be very happy to see anybody having uh, a proof for the case where the annealed complexity is not equal to the quenched. And that happens a lot, all the time, in fact. So, it's rather the exception of the two are the same, always, right? So, and then suddenly we are completely disarmed. As mathematicians, I don't know how to start. I wrote a paper with physicists, in fact, with uh, Biroli, Giulio Biroli, Chiara Camarota, and Valentina Ross, where we propose a way to do that, which we call the uh, cat's rice, replicated cat's rice. So we mix the crazy replica methods of physics and cat's rice to propose something. This is good for physics. It predicts exactly the right results, but mathematically it makes no sense, even though I signed the paper. So that's why I'm telling you, careful, right? And, and it's of course published in physics, but mathematically, I, I, I don't think there is a method to do that. Uh, the only method people have in mind is the one you mentioned, computing higher moments, but it, it can fail. It's provable that there are many regions, even in simple model, where quench is not annealed. I mean, the complexities are not the same. So then you're stuck. I, at least I'm stuck. And uh, I mean, if you come up with a good idea, please let me know. I, uh, that would uh, that would be fantastic. Honestly, I don't know. Okay. Well, I think we've had. A some great questions and some great answers. Um, I'm going to hand back to uh, 
uh, Christina and Alex, who know a little more about, uh, who probably are on the ball about how to finish off this 